Matthew 7, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they came from the marketplace, excuse me, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Now think about that for a minute. If something is devoted to God, it's going to benefit those who are working in the temple, isn't it? So that would be to their advantage to cause people to think that they can't give to their own family, to their own mother and father, but that they should devote to the temple. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Please hear that, those of you who are saying that you don't eat pork for a particular reason. If you want to not eat pork, that's fine. But to say that you don't eat pork because in Leviticus it says blah, 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 scripture is very clear, very clear that in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Verse 20, he went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There are some, of the peop- some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly walk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. <laughs> Can you imagine? He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, I'm sorry, surely I'm not going to say this right, but it's F-fatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Okay, so what are we hearing about the heart of God? First of all, he established food, clean food and unclean food, in order to separate the clean from the unclean. He does not like this rigidity that we have for human tradition. He desires that we have a heart for him, that we're understanding his heart in what he has established, and that we understand the fulfillment of spiritual things. And for this reason, I realize that there are a lot of people who very rigidly adhere to certain things on the Sabbath. And listen, if that's what God is teaching you personally, then that's between you and God. But I have not had that experience with him. I speak to people on the Sabbath. If someone's having a hard time, I will work with them. I heat up my food. The the things that I feel God pulling me into on Sabbath have to do with resting in him. I make a pot of soup and I heat it up in the microwave. Those are my meals during the day. Now, I don't want to lead you into something wrong, 
but I don't feel that that is wrong. What I feel is that God wants me to understand that I'm supposed to enter his rest on the Sabbath. I'm not supposed to be doing things by the work of my own hands and trusting in the work of my own hands. So these are the things that I am focused on, sitting with him, examining myself, checking, all right, how have I done this week with staying connected to him? Because if I want to go distract myself or I want to do anything else other than sitting in his presence, I'm not doing so well. I haven't been entering his rest. I need to examine what's going on in my flesh. Am I getting back pulled back in? The point for me, the point that I understand from God is that I need to enter his rest, that he established physical rest, physical withholding in order to help us to understand spiritual rest, spiritual withholding. Because when we're withholding the work of our own hands, we're not able to control anything and we truly have to enter into a space of trusting him when we're not distracting ourselves in order to repress our desires to control or worry or whatever it is, when we're not repressing and we're sitting with him in his presence, we're having to contend with those feelings. And there's nothing that's going to take us away from those feelings or cover them up. So this is the way that I have understood this with him. Now, that's not to say that I go to the store, that I do, I don't do other things, but I will heat up my food. And I do hear some people being very, very rigid about that. Um, Reform Judaism is one that is very rigid about that. They will not even change a light bulb on the Sabbath. But yet they'll have hired workers there to make sure that they are observing Sabbath, but not missing out on any of the luxuries of having someone wait on them. And so they're causing somebody else to disobey the Sabbath. That's ridiculous. You think that hiring someone on the Sabbath is not defiling his Sabbath? I think that's even more serious because you're, you're causing someone else to stumble. Okay, so nothing that goes into the body, nothing that's coming from outside is going to defile you. It's what's coming from your heart. It's a heart issue and everyone has to answer to God. But let me tell you something. We're answering to him now. We're not waiting to answer to him. If you're in him, you're already answering to him right now. So this is something you take up with him. Lord, does it bother you that I heat up food on this Sabbath? Does it bother you that I'm putting this in the microwave? What is your heart? What would you like from me today? Each of us needs to sort through that with him. Personally, I find it to be a failure if I am engaged on the Sabbath and I have not entered his spiritual rest. That to me is a bigger failure than if I didn't do, like if I just sat in a chair and withheld every physical activity from myself. If I don't spiritually rest, that is a failure for me on Sabbath. A while back, I was watching this. It was like this guy that goes in, um, he visits with these different like religious sects. And he was visiting with this family who was observing Sabbath. And they were real firm on like, we don't screw in a light bulb. We don't like, we don't do any of these things. We don't even touch the light switches. But they had all of these people waiting on them for their big giant celebration to self. And I remember him asking the wife who was um, going around show, like telling him, you know, this is what we do and this and that and just, you know, acting like they were so religious. And he said to her, she had this gigantic blingy Chanel belt on. Really, really worldly, like very gaudy. And he asked her about it. He said, I don't know, it was something to the effect of like everything that she had been talking about with regard to like humility and bringing yourself in this position and everything else. He he kind of um, called her bluff on it. it. He wasn't, I don't think he was being rude, to be honest. He just, you know, he even prefaced it with, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but can you tell me about the belt you're wearing? It was classic. It was classic because it really pointed out the hypocrisy of all of these things that she was talking about with totally with no understanding. 
And then you see them sit down to this gigantic feast while foreigners are waiting on them, essentially. People who they would consider not to be part of their nation, their people. Gigantic meal and celebration to self, just abundance, like overabundance. Only concern for their own people, their own family, and a total celebration to self. I mean, you could see like the men were like singing together and they were kind of drunk on the wine. The women are like doing their own thing. And it just reminded me of what God talks about in the word. When you were doing these things, did you not do them to yourself? Did you have any regard for me? It's really detestable. So my point in saying this is you can follow all the rules and not really get it. And that seems to be what Christ was saying to the Pharisees when he called them hypocrites and said, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions, the things you want to do for yourself. And yet the command of Moses, honor your father and mother in any, or the command through Moses, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their mother or father. So you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. So again, I say to you, if you withhold from your hands and you never enter God's rest, I personally believe that that is a failure because you have not entered the rest of God and that is the entire purpose of Sabbath, not a list of do's and don'ts. Withholding from your hands does not mean that you have entered God's rest. I don't know how in the world I always end up missing a section. So apparently I missed this section. Verse 24, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Now, you know what he's talking about because we saw this in Matthew. He's ta- he was saying that I came here for the children of Israel. And this, clearly, she's a Greek. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. So she hasn't, like, exalted herself. She hasn't, like, argued with him. She's just like, give me a little crumb. That's okay. You want to refer to me as a dog? That's fine. But just a crumb. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Man, I would have missed so much in that verse. It's such a fantastic verse. I love that. Or section, excuse me, set of verses. So what is it about her faith that he admires? What is it about her faith that he's respecting? The way that I see this is that she's not exalting herself. And also, she's continuing to pursue him, almost like she's not going to really take no for an answer. I mean, she's doing it respectfully, but she knows that he's the only one who can help her. And she could have been arrogant, you know? I mean, it's not like any race or nationality is superior to another. She could have been like, well, who are you and who are you know, the children of Israel. But being a foreigner, she respected who he was and who he came to serve. And she was willing to be spoken of as a dog. So what I see here is humility and also understanding because she could have gone to anyone, but she knew he was the only one who could help her. I'll take the lowly position, but please, Lord, help me. And then we've got this theme I'm, I'm just going to make a joke here because I think it's funny that they're always using, that, that God is always using um, Jesus' spit to heal people. You know, like with the blind man, he makes a little like, you know, thing of uh, a, a mud of spit and dirt. And then here with the mute man, he's uh, putting his spit on the man's tongue. Oh, and the man was also deaf and he put spit in his ears. I got to be honest, I don't know the significance of spit. If you feel that you do, please share in the comments. 
for me personally, when I hear these things, I think is, are there any scientific properties to healing, um, you know, blindness, deafness, and being mute with spit? Of course not. And yet Jesus healed all three with that. And of course, it's not the spit that's healing him. It's the power of God. But this is like the thing that he's using. To me, it just seems like, okay, there's no scientific properties to the to these things. There's either spiritual significance or maybe he's even mocking the things that we do. I mean, I don't know. Because we in, we've ingested some pretty dumb stuff from, you know, medicine. Things that break down the body. I think I'd rather ingest his spit than some of the terrible things that break down the body and mind that are just outright poisons. So again, you see this theme of Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it because they were overwhelmed in amazement. He's done everything well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And I just always feel from that that really he wants each person to believe on their own. And not so much on their own, but by the spirit of God. He wants to be able to see what is in each person's heart and that they've come to these conclusions because God has enabled them to do that, not because they're following the crowd or they're following the group think like so many of us are in the habit of doing, right? I'm a Republican. No, I'm a Democrat. All of this group think and not enough working on our own hearts. I hope you've enjoyed this teaching. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.